All right, everyone. I think um, we are ready for the next session. The one about the hot topics and master video session. May I invite Dr. Anis Ahmed to be our moderators and our first speaker too. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll uh, try not to put you to sleep and uh, let us see where we are. Okay. So, this is my hospital a few years ago. Okay. Right. So, this is where it all began. Right. Apparently, it, it was where the first open heart cardiothoracic surgery was done in Southeast Asia by history. Right. So why I'm putting that up is to show that, like the hospital, we've also come a long way, yeah? So currently, if you look at this slide, I think nothing as much has changed. You will find, apart from Asia, in general, you will find 60% of our operations are done open, and 40% are done by VATS. And VATS was not invented yesterday. You know, VATS has been there for the last 50, 60 years. So why has VATS progression stagnated? A variety of reasons. No proper visualization, no proper instrumentation, no proper teachers to teach, uh, not enough penetration. You can give a lot of excuses. But at the end of the day, history will tell you that our VATS penetration is still about 40% at best. Right. So, I think I'm going to quit the slide because uh, Zamir has already talked about it, okay, right? This is a paper from Annals of Surgery in the year 2002, and they already at that time put up this table where you have strengths of human and strengths of robot, okay? And I think it is quite self-explanatory, as you can see, right? So what is called robot? Robot comes from the word Czech, robota, means forced labor, okay? So we have a forced laboring machine for us, okay, which works for us, okay? People always ask me, who does the surgery? Sorry, I am the surgeon who does the surgery, so robot who helps me in doing a surgery, right? The growth of robots is like this. It's like the spread of cancer. That's the number of machines sold. And this data is from two years ago. Just double the numbers which you see here on the screen for the current 2020. All machines have since doubled in, since this number. Okay, right. Now, the biggest growth of these machines has come in Asia, surprisingly. So the number of machines in Asia is now double that in Europe, which is an interesting in the way how we have adapted as well, okay? So whether you like it or not, the robots have arrived, okay? All right, we are in town. Now, I take inspiration from Serfolio because I was, uh, he was one of my mentors when I started it seven, eight years ago. And then this paper, I think, told every surgeon in faraway lands to say how to start a program, okay? It gives you a basic idea of nuts and bolts and everything, all right? Uh, and then, I think the difference is that when he wrote, he said there's a steep learning curve. So now I beg to differ, because I think the learning curve, after practicing VAT surgery, the learning curve in VATS is much higher than in the robot, because robot is basically open surgery, basically open surgery. You're just sitting and doing surgery with an open film. So I'll just give you an example. You have a cancer like this. You can see it's a little bit central, and then uh, you want to see how you approach. So I. I just quickly play this video so that you get get the thing. So first, few things hits you straight away. Okay, one is the clarity. Okay, in the whole upper lobectomy, I probably need to take out the camera and wipe my face once. Big advantage over vats. Okay, because you're like every five minutes, if you have a bad assistant, which happens all the time in a teaching academic hospital, you're taking the camera out and wiping it all the time, right? You can curse and swear, and he will probably curse and swear back at you. You can curse and swear to the robot, it's not going to talk back to you. There's a bigger advantage, okay? It's the vision, 
It's a vision. So when you see things clearly, your mistakes come down. Your clarity is better. You don't commit errors, OK? Myth number two, oh, you don't have haptics. You don't know how much you're pulling. If you see things so clearly, you should know how much to pull. You're a surgeon, right? After a while, you will realize how much to retract and how much to pull and how it improves in your surgery, OK? I have not had an unnecessary inadvertent tearing of an artery or a vein because by pulling. Yes, when I have dissected lymph nodes which have been stuck, I have torn through arteries, and yeah, that is there, but not by pulling, no. So that is myth number two. Myth number three is that to start off, you should have done WATS. Then only you can do robotic surgery. It's completely wrong, okay? I feel people, there's actually a paper which shows why it is difficult for people who work on 2D planar to immediately switch to a 3D planar, and why an open surgeon can easily switch to robotics. Hashtag Sarfolio himself is the living proof. He went from an open surgeon to an excellent robotic surgeon. Okay? So these are the few things you need to know. Now, the other things is assistance. My assistant only comes in, this video was made about, I think, three years ago, right? So you will find my assistant coming in to staple the blood vessels. I still work with the same assistant. He's, he's my bedside assistant. He's pretty good at what he does. Fine. But you don't need that assistant anymore. You have your own robotic stapling, so you can control the stapler. So you cannot even shout at that single assistant who was at the bedside. Okay? So. What I'm trying to tell you is that probably you're taking away unnecessary interference in your surgery and the amount of personal errors which will happen. All these things move away when you start doing robotic surgery. Five, lymph node dissection, I think, is best done on the robotic platform. Why? Because you will see things much clearer. If you, if you just start to demo how to do an upper lobectomy, demo as to what we do in the steps of the operation, is that you will find if you clear off the lymph nodes, which is the bugbear of any starting oncologic thoracic surgeon, worth is salt. If you do the lymph nodes first, you will find the whole operation is much easier. Two, safer. Three, oncologically correct. So if you start with your lymph node dissections, your lobectomy is faster and easier. Please remember that. It makes a lot of sense as well, because everything is cleared off. Yeah? Last but not the least, the amount of blood loss for some reason in the robotic platform is much less. And how I'm telling you is that I'll show you papers later. You can actually quantitate by using what we call those rolled up gauzes, which I call the cigars. So we measure each cigar as blood loss equivalent to 10 mils of blood loss. So the amount of cigars you use in per case, you'll find initially you've been using five, and then it comes down to three, and then you hardly use anything if you're doing a thymic. So these things are important, OK? Right? I've not had a blood transfusion done on any of my patients since I started robotics, full stop. So that itself tells you a story. OK, right, let's move on. So not just about lung cancer surgery. You can do a lot of things with the robot, which is, in a, in a way, much better off. Okay, so this is a, what is this? This is an esophageal leomyoma. You will find that, you see. Uh, you, you see that, that the bulge there, okay? I have no one to help me in this case. So it's very simple. I have four arms. I have an extra arm, yeah? Somebody to push it away. So I have, I've grown an extra arm. I push off the lung, and then I carry on with the surgery. You can do it at your own pace. There's no rush. I'm just sacrificing the azagos vein because the tumor was encompassing it. This is a beautifully comfortable platform to do a complex case like this because one, it's in a difficult position that people don't forget. Once upon a time, you would have done an extended thoracotomy to go high up into the neck to get there. Yeah, But now with this platform, you will find that, OK, I can see everything clearly. I have a lot of accessory technology to help me, including the use of Firefly, where I can exactly delineate. Such a well-encapsulated tumor. So that's me on the screen, those blue marks there. It's actually being done by my resident. So I'm putting the blue marks on the screen to tell him, hey, cut here, cut here, cut here. So I'm teaching him. And I'm teaching. When I'm teaching, it becomes safer, because he exactly knows what to do. You cannot transfer this kind of thing's skill set to any other minimally invasive or even open surgery platform it becomes difficult. So these are the advantages of this kind of thing, right? So this is basically esophageal leomyoma, just enucleation. As you see, it nicely comes off. At the end of the day, you just hold it, and then uh, 
you do your what you call the cycle tube test you test for uh, it's nice well encapsulated just don't go into the mucosa and then you're done yeah that's it and then you pour water you test for air leak you can see the esophagoscope OGD that's fine okay right now what about difficult anatomy so this is this is sitting in an AP window you have like not common but you will have lymph nodes or you will have neurogenic tumors like this if you have like AP window tumor <laughs> I feel this platform is the best because it gives you a margin of safety because you can actually see what you're doing, right? So you will find that you can do things deliberately, you can do things slowly, and doing an AP window is not exactly the most comfortable of feelings even for an experienced thoracic surgeon. But with this platform, I think life is much safer and much easier to do, all right? So this is an AP window tumor. It is a benign schwannoma, and then you can see the PA and iota is quite shaved and well. Right, how about thymic? Uh, Alan showed you yesterday how to do it using WATS. So this is just the same platform, but, but different platform, but the same methodology. This is, of course, a tumor on the left side. The advantage with this is that I use an inflated chest. So you will find, especially if you have tumors on the left side, on a robotic platform, because you inflate using gas, you will have more space. When you have more space, your operation becomes much easier. And suddenly, you will find that, yeah, OK, I can do this off better off. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to convert, OK? Remember, if you miss it, it's going to be a median stenotomy. That should be in the back of your mind, all right? This is not, uh, this is not uh, what you would call a cosmetic operation, right? This is a cancer operation. And you want to get the best for the patient. But at the same time, you want to see whether you can avoid a big median stenotomy, right? So this is with the lung. You can do all kinds of things with in, on this platform in a comfortable way. You can take off the pericardium in mass, yeah? And then uh, you take off the tumor, and then you put the thing back. Then you, I usually put a pericardial patch because I think patient will get radiation at the end of the day. Right. Uh, I think basically this platform is much suited for complex operations. Right? Even more complex operations becomes even easier. How about a tumor like this? You got a bulky carcinoid. Uh, it's really a bulky carcinoid. This one is. You see that? And that, that carcinoid is completely encompassing. So you will just, uh, just a quick run of this. Right? You will find that uh, you can see the tumor kind of blocking off the right upper lobe completely and then spilling over into the bronchus intermedius. So for the juniors out there, this is how you plan your operation. You look at how much margin you're going to take and stuff like that. Your bronchoscopy is a key part of the operation. After assessing, same principle. You start by doing the lymph node. Always and all the time, always start by the lymph node. Right? Once you do the lymph nodes, the whole operation becomes easy. I'm just going to quickly run by. Right? I'm not even, this is not about, OK. Now, if you're doing a station 10 lymph node like this, I think this is one of the most comfortable ways to do it. You will find a lot of twisting and turning when you're doing in WATS. And there's a lot of strain on the surgeon's shoulder, uh, eyes, and thing. Why I choose the robotic platform, I tell you my exact reason, because I'm a lazy surgeon. I want to sit down, relax, have a cigar, and operate. That's good life. And when I'm 75, whether you like it or not, your hands are going to shake. Yeah? Robotic platform still makes you look like a genius. That's it. Full stop. So these are the few advantages. If you're a young surgeon, I would jump on this bandwagon now. All right. OK. So uh, an operation like this, this is a sleeve lobectomy. So you will find that when you do a sleeve, you actually, with this, uh, with this platform, this is the best way to do a sleeve, I think so. You will really love doing it. The, the suturing at the end is not a pain. It's a pleasure, OK? So you, you, you get to do it very well, OK? Yeah, and then uh, so actually, at this point in time, it is my residents who do this. They actually start learning stitching here. So this is the best way to learn and to teach. I think it's the most comfortable way to do any form of uh, complex surgeries like this. Right, let's move on. So we did, uh, we did a publication uh, first five years. We have done about uh, 400 cases so far. Uh, our mortality is less than 1%. 
and uh, complications all are within acceptable limits. It's on the STS, what you would call shared thing. So we also published individual data, like we did thymectomies, um, and I think uh, all these results will tell you that the amount of time the patient spends in a hospital, the amount of complication rates on any MIS platform is very hard to do beat a robotic platform when it comes to it. Okay? Right. Now, okay, I'm just going to move. So this is uh, Serfolio's paper where he compared his forearm technique to the rib sparing thoracotomy which he used to do. I don't think it's comparing apples and apples, but at the end of the day, it is what you have is the gold standard which you want to compare with, and we show that it's better results. So these are our results, which is in the process of publication. So I'm sorry, is that not clear? Yeah, it's clear, yeah. Yeah, yes, okay, right. So we, uh, we did the first uh, analysis of our first consecutive 60 stage one and two cases uh, done robotically. We find that the average blood loss in about 75% of the patient is less than 30 mils. Uh, and all the, on an average patient goes home after 48 hours after a lobectomy. And uh, what is more interesting, what we found is that the cancer results, the, at the end of the day, it's a cancer operation. So your oncology results matter. And we found that stage one and two survivals are pretty decent. Uh, with accepted any accepted international norm. But it, with a twist in our population, which I said in my talk yesterday, is that many of these women who are EGFR positive, stage one, have a higher recurrence and relapse rate for some reason, unexplained, and we are in the process of studying it. Right? Okay. That's it. So every day I tell my wife I'm going to do those robotics, so she says, yeah, what the hell, I also use a robot at home. Yeah? Okay. So, and she does it with, the, with her handphone, yeah? So, you, you have kits at home where the robot is already in operation. So, it's not a big deal. And we've always made robot the cost villain because it is a monopoly so far, okay? By the end of this year, I think Medtronic should be ready by the end of this year with their robot. And by 2022 Jan, I think uh, the DigiWorld will be ready, which is the j, &J robot. Okay, but uh, if you are in a hurry to buy something, I would also recommend that you can go and look at Titan. I think uh, it is a damn good platform too. Yeah, right? I have no particular interest in any company. Nobody pays me. Right, training. I think training this is the best. The robotic platform offers you the best for training, okay? You sit with your colleague or junior, your resident, you take him through step by step, you feel uncomfortable, he's going to make a mistake, you can take it away from him. It's like a car driver teaching you with your driver sitting next to you, okay? He's got absolutely control about what is going on, right? Single port robotics, I'm not very sure where we are heading at this point in time for thoracic surgery. Don't, don't get me wrong, for thoracic surgery. I don't think we are on the right track yet, okay? Um, yeah, as I said, Titan is a good one. I think Verb's been coming from 2015, so they are now in their ninth iteration, they call it. Look at that, me putting up the slide saying it is coming early 2018. Where are the Medtronic people? They are somewhere in the room, yeah. So, so that's, that's the truth. That means it is not easy to beat an already very good existing instrument in the market. But the promise from these companies is that they will give it for the price of a VAT surgery. That, that's it. Then the equation of saying this is more expensive or that is gone out of the window already. Yeah? Okay. Right. So robots, whether you like it or not, are part of the society now. I know it's crazy saying that they are part of the society, but it is the truth. So in my country, where everybody pretends to be extremely busy, even to their own parents, sisters, or brothers, or whatever. So we have robots now which sit and talk with old age people in the old age house. So we recently introduced the talking humanoid in our, what we call, peer society, Taekwon, model society. So they sit down, these robots actually sit down, and you can hold their hand. Actually, the hand can grow warm or cold, depending on the response from the patient. Uh, so it is quite an interesting concept, but society as a whole, don't run away from it. 
robot is coming into your life one way or the other. Yeah? So I think we are there. Right now, we are in this big mumbo jumbo on top, which is dominated by Intuitive. All right, and you have all these multiple robotic companies working in different corners. But I think ultimately everything will f move into this, what we call the digital universe. This is the robot with an AI platform. The plan from future robotic companies which are working on this is to tell you how to operate. And that's a profound statement coming from the CEO of J&J. When he introduced, he said, our plan is to tell you to do surgery without committing an error. So they will load in about three and a half million lobectomies already done into the platform. And then they, you can put in your CT scan. The computer will guide you to the best way to do surgery. This is not future. This is coming in two years' time. And you better get on board. Yeah? So right now, you're like a James Bond with so many guns. And you know, everything is in, in different positions, which you are. But I would rather be like this. One gun. Done. It, it serves all the purpose. But is this what I want? No, this is what I want. I want to travel in style, in comfort. That is what you want to do with robotic surgery. As you grow older, I'm pretty sure at some point in time, you will find that the pyramid is going to shape up in such a way that if you don't keep up to the top of the pyramid, you're going to fall off at some stage. And you should make sure that age is not a factor which pushes you off, or physical limitations doesn't push you off. Professor Anthony in last year made a very interesting observation to me. He said, maybe, Anis, I should have learned robotics. Then I would have still continued to do what I'm doing. I said, yeah, your knowledge is there and everything is there. So you don't look, you, there should be no limitation to a surgeon just based on his physicalities to say he cannot. Because your knowledge is accumulated over the years. It doesn't vanish. Yeah? OK. I think the major problem in Asia is the capacity and training. Just because you buy more robots doesn't mean that everybody's going to robotic train. Yeah? So you need to increase capacity. How do you increase capacity? The number of surgeons being trained. For that, we need to have a proper training which is induced at a very early stage. So nowadays, we take residents from year four onwards into the robotic training plan, program. For thoracic, from year six onwards, they are already there. So they compulsorily, they do all the basic stuff, including cadaveric work and stuff. And you, you don't have a proper accreditation and certification. So somebody goes back from here to and back home and say, oh, how do they know that you're accredited and trained? So we are working on that. Should Asia have a universal system? I don't know where we are heading with this. I think we should have one by hopefully soon. Healthcare spending is going to go up, whether you like it or not. This is my country. It's about 2020, we hit 12 billion. That is completely false news. We hit already 16 billion last year. So the cost of healthcare is going up. So how are you going to cut down healthcare when you have such an expensive robot? I think the real problem is not in robotic surgery. The problem is in the patient. We are operating on 60-year-olds, 65-year-olds, and telling them they are old. But now, my average age for an elderly patient is about 75. And I work in the largest geriatric hospital. My oldest patient who op I operated on was 89. So the problems with age create different sets of problems for you as a surgeon. So therein lies the real problem. So that is why I strongly inculcate you to take up robotics as a platform, because it gives you the best option, I think. OK? So this is how our setup looks like. I think. Doing robotic surgery, I think, still is a bit archaic. I think this is the way to go. If you really want to treat your patients with lung cancer, you need to know how to treat lung cancer without cutting up a patient. And we as thoracic surgeons should be, keep that in mind and understand that platforms like the ENB or the new up and coming multi-view, the new and coming vision one by thing, which everything is done bronchoscopically and endoscopically, you should be well versed in it because that will be your career in the future, not cutting up any patients. So we've uh, gone from that hospital to this hospital, and so has surgery progressed, okay, right? Thank you guys. Any questions for me?
Thank you. Ah, no worries. It's, it's just me. I'm just a random guy. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to be very honest, I'm I'm totally convinced that the robot is the future, and I'm very very interested in using it. It's just so much more comfortable. I, I did train in the robot myself, but the reality is, unfortunately, for many of us here in Asia, it's sometimes it's not a matter of me saying I want a robot. Somebody actually has to buy it because I don't I can't afford it. So, and unfortunately, in many uh, hospitals all across Asia, uh, we still have uh, uh, logistical difficulties in acquiring a robot system. So, for the present, I think a lot of us are still stuck with VATS. But it's not a bad thing. I mean, of course, VATS nowadays is not the VATS of five years ago. I mean, we've moved on a great deal. And uh, you're very familiar, of course, with uniportal VATS. So I'm not going to spend any time at all talking about uniportal VATS. You all know how to do it. You've all seen Diego doing his surgery, either on YouTube or in live demonstrations. But I think uh, what the, 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 the conference has asked me to do is just show you a few uh, videos of cases other than the standard lobectomies and segmentectomies. So it's a little bit beyond just a standard lobectomy, just a few, uh, three videos to share with you today. Just to show you that even if you don't have the robot right now, you can just get on and just do VATS and you can still get away with quite a lot with very little morbidity to your patients. So I think the first case, okay. Oh, it's not turned on, okay. Yeah. Okay, now it's turned on. Okay. So the first case is this one. Uh, we operated in a few years ago. So it's not a very huge tumor. It's fairly big, but it's very, very central, and it's kind of uh, stuck onto the uh, right main pulmonary artery. And this case was actually referred to me from Australia, actually. Um, an Australian surgeon, uh, a bunch of them actually, had a look at this and said, no, no, we don't want to operate. And they referred him straight on to the oncologist. So he flew over to Hong Kong and found me and says, well, well why not? I, it doesn't look that bad. It's, it's fairly operable. So we just went in and we just uh, carried on a straight uniportal vat. So this is the particular case. It's big, it's central, but it's, there's no lymph node spread. So yes, yeah, eminently operable. So this is the operation. Histology. Sorry? Histology. Histology. This is, I uh, can't remember, I think this is squamous, I think. Yeah, this is straightforward. So this is a standard uniportal view. Now, what I want you to see from this video is not that, oh, there's a fancy technique or anything. It isn't. This is quite a boring video, and that's the whole point. For all of you, and I'm sure everyone here in this audience is already doing a VATS pneumonectomy, VATS lobectomy, it's standard. I mean, I'm not doing any fancy tricks or tips or anything. It's standard instruments, and, um, and, and uh, I'm going very slowly. But the only thing you'll notice the difference from uh, three-port vats and this uniportal vats is perhaps the view. Now, what you'll notice in this view, of course, is first we're looking top down. When we have a uniport and you put it in the camera, we always emphasize that you put it at the top of the wound and use your 30-degree lens to look down on the field. So you'll see uh, my instruments coming in from this 5 o'clock and from the 7 o'clock position, and it's very ergonomic. Top-down view, nothing fancy, standard instruments. Back then, I was still using a standard Yanker suction and even standard diet thermy for my dissection. Very, very simple. Now, this, this, uh, this, this uh, 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock position is very important. Now, you'll notice here, wait a minute, Alan, look, you're just doing one-handed. No, I'm not. I'm using a two-handed technique. You don't see my left hand because my left hand is actually coming in from this position and I'm retracting the lung myself. Now, if you've seen a lot of Diego's videos, uh, you'll, you'll know that he does it uh, with an assistant. He likes having the assistant reach in with an extra hand to do the retraction for him. But I don't trust my assistants that much. And that's where the robot comes in handy. But because I don't trust my assistants that much, I, I do it myself. And the good thing about that is that it gives me a lot of haptic feedback. So I'm retracting this and I can adjust the, uh, the tension on my retraction and the angle of my retraction second by second, just to, to help me uh, out here. And so, for example, just going through this vessel here, I don't need to retract too much, just enough, and I know exactly how much is safe as I pass my dissector past these vessels. So you can see in this particular case, we're going quite centrally. I had to open a bit of the pericardium to actually reach down here. So it's a little bit intrapericardial, not fully intrapericardial, but 
and uh, it, it's not that difficult at all. In this particular case, we chose just to go, go ahead and just do a pneumonectomy. The patient had very good lung function. In retrospect, uh, we could have done a, a sleeve resection. It would have been a very complicated sleeve resection because uh, the, the, um, the pulmonary artery branches to the lower middle lobes were involved as well. It would be a very fancy reconstruction. So having discussed with the patient, we just went ahead and we just did a, a, a pneumonectomy for this chap. Again, the, the view, is, I keep emphasizing, you see, as we go in here, it's a two-handed technique. So you see how we adjust this tension, sometimes more, sometimes less, to pass these staplers through without uh, uh, any undue tension, and that reduces the chance of any uh, inadvertent evulsion. I think more and more we're using a lot of these energy devices just to help us along the way. But again, I emphasize that a lot of the instruments you're seeing here are, are not that different from your standard VATS instruments, or even open instruments for that matter. Again, I just emphasize, there's nothing you're seeing here that you wouldn't do with a standard open or three-port VATS uh, pneumonectomy. It's very, very standard. And that is the key. I think for, for any surgeon moving on to uniportal, uh, the, you already have, you already possess the basic skills. It's only a matter of, of changing your visualization from top to bottom and, and getting used to the hands coming in quite naturally from the right and left-hand positions. And so that's just the last final step for the bronchus. This patient, as I said, we did a pneumonectomy for, uh, this is quite a long time ago now. Uh, the patient went home in three days. Uh, came back, I think all the lymph nodes actually were not involved, so we actually got a curative resection for this guy. Uh, just saw him on follow-up very recently. I think he's now four or five years after surgery now, and he's doing fine. Tiny bit there. <laughs> Another staple fire. Oh no, we just use a harmonic. And that was that case. Nothing, nothing really uh, fancy. So the second case I'm going to show you is, is uh, one of Diego's favorite operations, the old sleeve resection. And uh, sleeve resections, I think uh, it's nowadays it's pretty standard for us. And again, all I want to emphasize with this particular video is that there's not that much difference from a standard VAT uh, sleeve lobectomy. So this particular case, I don't have the CT, unfortunately, but it was just a, uh, a right upper lobe uh, sleeve lobectomy. As you can see, this is a bit sticky, this, little, this case, a bit annoying. But again, it's, it's not that much of a challenge nowadays. And again, with, with a uniportal view, the view is fine. There's no, no problem with the view visualization whatsoever. And again, you're seeing that top-down visualization, instruments coming in from the 5 o'clock and the 7 o'clock positions. Now this, as we're doing the vein, you can see this is what I call the rotation technique. So I insert it and I rotate this angulated uh, stapler sort of 90 degrees so it goes towards the head and it passes through the vein very easily. Again, you can only do that when you use the uh, bimanual uh, retraction, using my left hand to retract myself. So this part of the operation is pretty standard. It's a standard right upper lobe lobectomy. In this partic particular case, we just happened to do the uh, vein and now the artery first. So that, that's fairly standard. Completing the fissure, and as usual with any sleeve lobectomy, you always try and leave the uh, bronchus part till the last. And along the way, of course, you're dissecting all your lymph nodes. No problem at all. Very, very standard. That's uh, our ascending arterial branch. I'm a big fan of these vascular clips. They're fantastic. Uh, I use them either for lobectomies or segmentectomies, whatever. And uh, they have a very low, very thin profile. So even in places where you you're a bit hesitant putting in a big fat stapler. You can always get a staple, uh, one of these vascular clips across. So we're just completing the fissure there. We're still not to the interesting bit yet. Okay, so now what we've freed up the entire upper lobe. Hopefully, we're just down to the uh, 
bronchus. So again, I think you all recognize that it's always an idea to free up as much of the airway as possible. So we're just doing the uh, level four lymph nodes first, and it just gives you a bit more uh, retraction with the bronchus. We're also freeing up the pulmonary ligament, again, just so we can do this. So you can lift it up very nicely to do your um, incision into the main bronchus. And like uh, Zamir was saying earlier uh, this morning, uh, we always send off the margins for frozen section just to make sure that uh, you've got good, clean margins. So that's the uh, tumor coming out. See this bag, again, this is us saving money in Shenzhen. We just use a sterilized Ziploc specimen bag. Keeps the cost down. And they're actually it's much easier to use. So that's the actual wound you're seeing, you're seeing. So I'm not cheating. This really is our uniportal vats wound. Okay. So we've got nice clean margins, and we're ready to go on the suturing. So yeah, again, we're cutting off a bit of margin for frozen section. A few more lymph nodes just to give us a bit more um, uh, length to suture with. Now this is exactly the moment when I think, damn, I wish I had a robot. Yeah, absolutely. I don't argue with you. I mean, absolutely. If, I mean, the, the only thing is, not all of us have robots. That's the only thing. If I had a robot, make no mistake, I would use it. But nonetheless, what I'm showing you here is that even if you don't have a robot, that's no reason not to do a sleeve. I mean, this, the bronchoplasty is dead easy. So standard needle holder. This is just a normal needle holder. This is just, a, I think it was just a Robert forceps I was using here. Nothing, nothing fancy. You don't need any special instruments. With the uniportal view, again, I, I, I love it because this top-down view just makes the uh, hand-eye coordination a lot easier than even with three-port vats. With three-port vats, you can imagine you're looking from the bottom up towards the top, and your hands would be coming in from the two top ends. But in this particular case, it's very, very ergonomic. And you can see it's not that big a deal. With the robot, yeah, with the, with the wrist flexion, I think you can get the angles on this needle going through the bronchus a lot easier. But with the uniportal, again, it's, yeah, it'll, it'll, you spend a few more minutes, but it's no, no big deal at all. And you can get a, quite a nice anastomosis. In this particular case, we just had a bronchotomy, so we, just, we didn't have to do an end-to-end uh, complete anastomosis, but we've done quite a few of those, and that's not usually a problem at all. This particular case, fourth, fourth. Yeah, I think uh, Diego and I usually always tell people beginning uniportal that always use the fifth intercostal space, even for your upper lobe lobectomies. But for a sleeve, I mean, for this particular part, the fourth interspace is just so much easier. <laughs> the only difficulty when you use fourth space is that vein just now, is, is that uh, to get the stapler around the vein, you need to rotate your stapler around to get the vein out. But otherwise, uh, you can see this is, that easy. And again, I emphasize, I'm sorry, this is very boring because there's nothing special at all. And in theory, any one of you could go home tomorrow and just try this out. I mean, you're already doing this three ports anyway. I mean, just get rid of those two other ports. So just waste time. Nothing difficult at all. No, no special instruments, no special gear, just a standard thing. No, standard proline. <laughs> yes, controversial, very controversial. But this operation we do in uh, China. And in China, all our sleeves are done with proline. And uh, to be honest, I haven't actually seen any problem over the last five, six years. There's always that, uh, you know, the, the bronchial irritation thing. And I don't know, but uh, we, we've, seriously, we've never had any problems using proline. And it makes the this, this suturing so much easier. PDS, uh, we could do, yeah. Um, I, I actually have done a few of PDS. Yeah, you're right, it makes no much difference. But in China, I think uh, often uh, the, they're a bit more pedantic about it. We've always used proline. I said, oh, what the hell, give me proline. Uh. And I don't know, proline goes through tissues really, really nicely, so <laughs> I don't complain. You see, my technique's not brilliant, so you see I've already bent the needle. <laughs> Yeah, but that's it. No, okay. 
And so, I don't know, I've got a few minutes left. I think I'll just show you the last video. So again, this is just, just for desserts. Uh, this is a young patient. We've, for some strange reason, in China in recent years, I've got a reputation for doing a lot of sequestrations. So in Shenzhen, I get referred to many, many cases of these sequestrations. You know, pretty destroyed lobe, 34-year-old, multiple infections over the years. And so this is us doing a, a single port sequestration operation. We got a good visualization before uh, surgery, so we can see the abnormal vessels already. You can see here, it's quite a thick, thick, uh, thick uh, vessels here. So we've already taken down a lot of the adhesions already, so I've shortened this video down. So there's still some adhesions here. Not a big problem getting uh, all the adhesions down with the uh, uniportal. And again, we're just using a pair of long medicine bounce scissors. Again, no fancy instruments required. No multi-million dollar robot <laughs> required. <laughs> You could do this all tomorrow, really. You can do it tomorrow. That's a standard Yanker suction. This is a standard harmonic scalpel. Standard pair of scissors. <laughs> and just like you would do with any three-port uh, vats. And uh, that's our abnormal vessels right there. I think you've got a cluster of these abnormal vessels. Quite easy to dissect. I think we all have our own preferences about how to deal with these vessels. Uh, I was doing this case in Shenzhen where I wasn't so trusting of my team. So I, I did uh, triple sec securing of these vessels. So I, I, I uh, ligated it, I put clips on it, and then I stapled it. <laughs> Yeah, so I just ligated it not too firmly just to reduce the flow, and that was enough to allow me to apply uh, vascular clips. I love these vascular clips in all situations. They're so easy to apply. Very, by and large, very safe. I've only had one problem ever with these vascular clips. When I finished the lobectomy, and I was uh, taking the specimen out of the wound, and the specimen caught on one of these clips, and as I pulled the specimen out, it ripped the clip off. That was the only time I ever had a big disaster. Uh, but otherwise, they were very safe. So again, that reduced the flow enough, and I just, you know, see, this is me being ultra-cautious. <laughs> Ligation, uh, clip, and then I stapled it. <laughs> Probably you don't need to do all this, but uh, that was just me being me. Yeah. and then we just staple it off. And the rest of the operation is, uh, this is actually more than one feeding vessel. This is still not the vein, actually. This is actually, I think in total, this guy had three or four uh, abnormal feeding vessels. But I think it just, just emphasized that, you know, regardless of what approach you want to use, open, multi-port, single port, robot, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, you just have to be careful when dealing with these cases to make sure you spot all these abnormal vessels. So we just did exactly the same thing for each of these vessels. I think this was just a standard hemolock clip. No, no conflict of interest, by the way. I'm not selling this product. No. Nowadays in Hong Kong, I, I use clips by a different company that comes with a 45 degree angle applicator. And it's even better for Uniportal when you apply these clips. Yeah, you know what I found is, I, I, I recently moved into private practice and all my camera assistants are nurses, and they're much better than junior doctors. <laughs> much better. Almost as good as robot. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the rest of the operation is, is just the standard lobectomy from this point on. So I think I'll, I'll just end there. My time's just up. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no questions? <laughs> OK, thank you very much. OK, thank you.
Yes, this uh, we, we saw on the pre-op CT already with the reconstruction. That we, we always do this routinely. Every time we see a suspected CCAM or uh, sequestration, we always go through an MDT, get the reconstruction. So it's good planning. I think in this particular case, we saw at least one of the big feeding vessels. But as we dissected, I think we ultimately, I think we found three or four. I think two of which were, were not seen. So, I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, if you're just a careful VAT surgeon, you know, you'll, you'll spot things and it's usually quite easy. I think that's why you're overconscious of that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, plus it was quite big, as you saw. <laughs> it's quite a big, thick one. So I, th I thought if I just apply a stapler immediately on it, there's always a chance that uh, the tension would, might cause bleeding and oozing. So uh, what I did with the first ligating suture is I didn't tie it really tight but tight enough to reduce the flow so that anything I do distal to that would be at lower, lower pressure. So that, that's why I did it. But uh, I, I don't know if it really has, makes any difference, but it made me sleep better. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, our, our brilliant young surgeon from, <laughs> from, 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 from Bangkok, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Chest trauma. Chest trauma. Yes. Um, thank you to the committee for, for giving me an uh, opportunity to talk in this uh, prestigious meeting. Um, let's switch the gear to the, the chest trauma. I have no disclosure. This is what what is the very <laughs> major problem in, in, in Thailand and in Southeast Asia, that motorcycle and teenager, they do reckless have rigorous behavior, and believe it or not, Thailand ranked the first of the most traffic, uh, road traffic death in 2017. Okay, more, and you can see that the rest of the list, it's, it's in Africa, so we are the only Asian country around too. Right. And since 2020, so coronavirus causes people to seek uh, 30,000, and causing death 600. Uh, the road traffic accident alone in Thailand causing four times more of death. So it's not an epidemic in, in Thailand. That, that's why we, we, have, we, we have a lot of um, the, the, the trauma, the blunt trauma patient. So I'm going through some slides because the, 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 the procedure is, is very straightforward for, for the sort of trauma. So uh, the rib fracture occurred about 20-25%. Uh, uh, the most common in the blunt chest injury is associating with the hemodermothorax on contusion, uh, secretion obstruction, and, and neurovascular internal organ injury. The rib anatomy is it's, it's pretty thin, and um, cortex is only one millimeter, very, very soft marrow, and uh, it's applied uh, of the blood and nutrient from the periosteum, and it rotates along its course. And each of the rib has a different size and thickness. So when you try, when you want to fix the rib with a metal plate, you have to be aware of their characteristic like this. Okay, and the proximal fixation into the cartilage point. So when, and when you have to think about where to put the screw if you want to put it proximally because the cartilage will not hold the screw well. And the distal fixation will be on transfer process if you need to fix in the posterior part. And chest physiology, the human body breathes approximately 20,000 to 30,000 times a day, and there, there is a movement in four-dimensional vertical from the diaphragm, horizontal, AP diameter, and also the rotation of the ribs, each of the breath that you take. And uh, the upper chest move not, not much, only 10, about 10%, but the lower chest move up to 20% due to, due to the flattening of the diaphragm. And it's highly flexible. So, uh, so when you want to fix the rib, you have to be aware of all of these characteristics, okay? Um, the failed chest, it's, it's, you all know about this, and um, mortality and mobility 
it, it is most likely from the pulmonary complication. When I, when I talk to of, of this chest trauma patient, I'm, not going, I'm always saying that, that you're not going to die from the fracture, but you will have a serious complication. You may have a serious complication from your lung, pneumonia, ARDS, intubation, tracheostomy so on and so on. And there are some studies that are saying that the, mo the direct thoracic injury is a stronger predictor of trauma-induced ARDS. And the, the onset of the ARDS in polytrauma population, um, the median time is three days. So if you want to do anything um, invasive, which you, you probably you should wait more than three, pref preferably more than five days, and and the the risk of it is a lot smaller. Okay, there there are some protocols uh, which interesting. Uh, there's this there this this institution only uh, make a protocol only for the rib fracture management, and they focus on two major aspects. They they do not mention anything about the st st stability of the chest wall, but what they concern. It's pain and respiratory. They create a score, called a peak score, um, pain, inspiration, and cough. So the, the, the lower it gets, the more severe the patients have. So this is what we are, what we taking care of the patient. There's um, rib fracture, the flail shares in the back, on the side. Um, some are very, very severe that uh, you have uh, the rib, it's, it's, it's going into the chest completely. So the goal of treatment for the, for the chest injury for the rib fracture patient is to have a shorter ICU stay, fewer pneumonia, and reduce mortality. That should be your primary objective. Okay? The, the pain, lung capacity, quality of life, it's, it's, all, it's, it's the concern too, but, 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 but not as much as the first threes. So um, there's uh, some special consideration uh, of, of, of the associated injury, such so hemoneumothorax. So um, it's, if it's a, you, you, you should put in if, if the, there's a large amount of, of the pneumothorax, it's mandatory. But for the small amount, um, you don't really need to put the chest strain, but, but you need, in, in case of the patients going through other uh, procedures, need a positive ventilation. And I always talk, tell my resident that um, avoid trocar type ICD at all costs. Okay? There are a lot of complications down the road. Um, you, only, you should only put the trocar type ICD in the massive pneumothorax. Okay? Not, and, um, and even the nice guy, uh, th there's the topaz that, that Dr. Khan mentioned about that. Uh, it, it's a very effective um, system, suction system. It tells you the continuous air leaking out, um, the, 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 the volume of fluid drained out in the last um, 24, uh, 42, uh, 72 hours. And um, even the NICE guideline in the UK, they, they, they mentioned this, that topaz should be considered. It, it's, it's rare that they, that they use the brand name in their guideline, but this one they use topaz to be considered for people who need chest drainage after a pulmonary resection or because of a pneumothorax. Okay. And um, lung contusion and atelectasis is a sign of the high level impact, and um, you should consider doing early VAT lung recruitment. It, it's different from, from doing the, 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 the normal recruitment by positive ventilation. Um, when, when we do the early lung, VAT lung recruitment, we, we use a double lumen, and we, we even put a fogarty to the non-affecting lobes to make sure that all the pressure going into that affecting lung. Sometimes you need more than 30 um, centimeter of water of the positive pressure to bring the lung back. So, so positive pressure through the, through the non-selective intubation, not, not really effective. And secretion obstruction. Um, 
it, it, it happens a lot because the patient lose their chest mechanics. They cannot breathe, they cannot create, a, they cannot cough adequately, secretion become obstructed. And you should consider a early type bronchoscopy even without the needs of positive pressure. Um, young um, adult patient, they tend to have a, a very high threshold and all from both patient and physicians to put a tube in the patient that can breathe by themselves. But sometimes you, if, if they cannot cough adequately and with a history of smoking, you should consider to do a toilet bronchoscopy early. So proactive is mandatory, it's very important in the chest trauma patient to avoid a pulmonary complication. This is the, the guideline that we developed at, at our BDMS, at our institution. So I uh, just want to focus that this is the consensus be between trauma surgeon and a CVT surgeon and a thoracic surgeon that if they, in three days, lung is not completely expand, they should consult a thoracic surgeon to help taking care of the patient. Either they need to do a CT scan of the chest, early vas, or bronchoscopy intervention. Same as pneumothorax, pneumothorax, pneumothorax. And uh, for the rib fixation, when, when should you consider it? So it's, it's, in the, it's in the guideline of the trauma now that um, the, uh, the recommendation is, is more than five segments of flare chest requiring a ventilation, mechanical ventilation. Um, that, 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 that's the major guideline. That, that's the major recommendation. Uh, the symptomatic non-union is more than six months that is still not unite and patients have chronic pain and they, they want it fixed, or uh, severe displacement found during a thoracotomy, that, that, um, that, 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 that's the thing that you should do. That, and then you should consider, consider to, to fix the rib if there's more than three rib flail not requiring mechanical ventilation, or more than three rib with severely displaced fracture, or much moderate displa displacement, but lose a lot of lung capacity. But um, there's something that you should consider too, that if, if you go in through the vas and fracture is not contained in the polyteral pleura, that you can see the bony fragment in the pleural space, that you can guarantee that it's not going to heal because you need the pleural, parietal pleura, so the bone callus can form. So that's the one of the consideration. Or the posterior fracture. If it, sometimes the fracture can look very bad, but when it's come into the posterior part of the body where the, there's a lot of muscle, the back muscle, the patient normally can do okay. Breathe fine, pain score is low, so some, you don't really need to fix them. And so if there's concomitant sternal fracture and causing a flail chest that you have to consider fix the sternum too. So this is my, 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 uh, the most important of the slide. Um, so key point in chest trauma. So the most important is procedure for airway. Okay? If, the, if, the, if the patient loses the airway, it, 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 they'll, they'll need the intubation. And afterward, more, uh, more pulmonary complications will happen. If you can sec once you can secure the airway, the next it should do drain the pleura. You can do it at the same time, but I want you to focus on the airway first. And afterward, this procedure for pain control, either epidural, um, the nerve block, intercostal nerve block, part of a, a tribral block, is also fine. Consider regional block for patient. And then, the, the, the first three, you have to complete them first to consider procedure for the chest wall stability. Okay, so I'll go to the, my cases. This is the 74-year-old the male. It's a car accident, and the passenger's dead on scene, so very um, high-velocity injury. He had a blunt and chest, chest and head injury, and he has a bilateral hemoneumothorax that the ICD put in, nine units of blood transfused. Um, that's a flail chest of the left second to, uh, second to seventh rib, on the both side, and also the sternum. And it uh, has a 
fracture of the long bone, a blunt abdominal injury, which is uh, very st uh, which is okay, not 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 very bad, mild head injury. Uh, so I went in to clean to clear the chest on day three first. This is what um, you can see the 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 ribs depressed a lot on both sides of the chest. So um, I wait three days patient still stable, five day is still okay, and they're still air leaking out. So I think there's some there's something wrong on the right chest. So I went in with the with the vats. So this is what we found. Is the injury. The, um, the 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 video so and I stable the the hole. It it it's very straightforward procedure. So I don't want to waste much of the time on the video. Uh, this is the video course anyway, so I'll show it to you. Staple it. Um, it's not my hand, it's checking. It's this computer, it <laughs> can't keep up with the, with the frame rate. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll pass it along. Okay, I cut it out. Initially, we were thinking about fixing the rib or not because the patient is is still ventilated and hit his brain it, it's still um, even though he's awake at that moment but um, the neurosurgeon doesn't want, doesn't want to do a, a major surgery yet but what we what do you really find is this you can see the bony fragment is punctured out of parietal pleura that, that, that's the main thing that we consider to, to do a rib fixation for this patient because it won't heal. And it can cause an pulmonary injury if, we, if he is going to be on the, the positive uh, ventilation for longer. Okay? All right. Uh, I, I want to show you the other cases, not related to this one. But um, this patient has a, has a very severe... Um, flail chest too, okay? But it contained in the pleura. It contained in the pleura, so it, it will look like this. You can see there's a, this is the area of the posterior fracture, down second to eighth ribs, yeah? And, and she ended up not requiring the fixation. The pain score was only four with this amount of the displacement. So it's just very straightforward procedure. So you went in with the thoracotomy at your preference. Um, it, it can be actually a thoracotomy if, if you want to fix multiple ribs. If you want to fix a couple of ribs, you can do a standard postural thoracotomy. You reduce it and you fix it with the plate. Very easy. Everyone can do it without, even without the, the um, having seen it before. It's very easy. So you fix it with a screw um, and use the, the motorized screwdriver. Okay. Okay, so at that, this is at the end of the case. So we, we f on the right side, we fix um, two ribs and we um, since the, the third rib, it's, it's hind, really hind behind the scapula. We don't, we, we don't have the minim, minimally invasive instrument yet. So we did the splinting by using like suture splinting, like body splint, third to fourth rib together to stabilize that. And on the left, on the other side, we, we fixed um, fourth ribs together. That that uh, that the other hole is that uh, that's necrotic tissue. We need to debrid. Okay, and he was able to win the TPS the next day and extubate it on day three afterwards. This is the case number two. Um, another road traffic accident, so multiple fractures, ten segment. Um, unable to be in off the ventilator on day five. Okay. So we fix the the third to seventh. We, you don't really need to fix all those ribs, just to make sure that chest is stable. 
okay, for the trauma patient. Otherwise, you you make a long and uh, <laughs> a very big incision. Uh, this is another uh, thing that I want to make sure that you guys get the idea that to make sure that the bronchoscopy, okay, in the tube it look very dirty, and the you can when you talk to the nurse they say oh there's a lot of a very small secretion not much at all but sometimes it's plucked, it's plucked to make sure that so you have to go in and clean the plucked airway, uh, the the milk plucked mucus. And once you, you clean that, it's a lot easier to clean with the, with the regular suction that the, the nursing staff use. So thoracic surgeon should have the bronchoscopy skills very fluently. So we fix fourth of them. And, and now we are with, uh, this is a trauma, uh, this is the tumor patient. It, we, 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 uh, and and if it's not a behind the scapular, you can make a smaller incision. I, I'm sorry I didn't have that the video in this case. Um, actually, I, the, 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 this is the, the fibrous dysplasia case. The, the ribs length come from here to here. But we make a small incision, and we just make a stab in, a very small stab incision large enough to put a screwdriver in and you put the screwdriver to strap incision. So make it a little more minimally invasive. OK. And this case, uh, it's um, the 53-year-old heavy smoker uh, fall. Has a bunch of abdominal injury, multiple fracture, 3rd to 12. And this is a uh, CT upon arrival. You see the collapsed lung. Looks like he is going to be a very bad case. Needs a rib fixation, definitely. Okay, but um, the first hospital did not put the patient on a suction, firstly, and managed very poor on the pain score. And, and in terms of pain, he were able to only that the breathe. There's a we we use it the we use the breathing exercise. Incentive spirometry have three balls, right? He can manage to bring up only one fourth of the first one. So what I what I did is just because this is only post-operative day two, I don't want to make a very big surgery at that moment. But I know he needs the airway clearance, so I br I brought him to the theater, did the bronchoscopy, and this is what I found: the mucus plaque on the right main bronchus totally. So we clean the airway. That this is the amount of mucus plaque. The the ball is about this big. Yeah, and at the end of the case is clear. Oops, sorry, it's clear. So he, we extubated him the next day. So we, we only intubated him overnight to first to make sure that his lung will, will re expand. Second, we cut the vicious cycle of pain. You know, you have pain, you can't breathe, the muscle gets cramped, hand gets more. So we, we cut that by intubating him overnight, extubating him the next day. The pain scored down to four to five. He went off oxygen the next, uh, the uh, post bronchoscopy day three, and he didn't need the rib fixation, even with the third to twelfth rib fractured. Okay, and he was discharged to the rehab center on day six. Okay, and this is the case that we just d with um, the the fracture second to eighth. Flail, but it's in the posterior part, okay, with the hemothorax. So we put a drain in. Um, the pain score is not very bad; at about six. Um, but but he can, but this patient can only breathe less than one balls of trifold, and also he 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 almost needs oxygen mask already. So I ask an anesthesiologist to put him the epidural. Pain is better. We went off the oxygen, and he went home on day six. Didn't need any procedure at all. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So, the pain and respiration—it's the major concerns. Okay. The, make sure that you take care of that first, and 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 even more than fracture himself. And timing for decision making is very important. Don't fix it on the first three days. Uh, we, uh, we, we've seen some cases that the patient has traumatic aortic injury, 
and the, the surgeon has seen, put the TIVA and did a rib fixation at the same time. The next day, the next day, the patient need to be on the VV ECMO because of the, the, the RDS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Just want to comment. Thank you very much. Really nice presentation, and I, I like your conclusions. They are a very sober and well balanced conclusion that you fix a rib when the patient is unable to get off the me mechanical ventilator. And that is really the main indication for fixing of ribs. I mean, I work in a center next to a national highway, 300 kilometers this side and 300 kilometers on the other side. So I get a trauma every night, okay? 300 cases in a year. And I would fix a rib once a year. Most of the times you do not need to fix the ribs. You know, you do the first three steps, that is make sure the airway is okay, make sure the pain is well controlled. You don't need to physically fix a rib until and unless you do not get him off the ventilator. If the patient is struggling on the ventilator, that's when I go in. And I wouldn't go in in the first few days, I'd go in a week or 10 days later. A lot of new literature, a lot of people standing on the platform and saying, fix, you know, two ribs, three ribs. All of this is industry driven. You know, the guys who are making the plates are actually pushing all the studies and they're pushing the surgeons to perform this. I have seen a couple of surgeons in UK who are fixing every single rib that they see willy-nilly. It's a very expensive operation. Actually, if you look at the cost of those plates, each plate is about $1,000, uh, you know? A screw, too. Yeah, screw is each also screw is $100. Right, so, right. so it's a very, very expensive operation. Right. And in this part of the world, it's, you know, if you have to put in five plates and 10 screws, it's a very expensive operation. So sometimes I've even used KYS just to fix it in a very poor patient. But uh, plates do work well. But you must not fix everything. That's the important thing. So thank, good thank you presentation and good conclusion. I like that. Thank you for comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, th thank you very much for your very excellent uh, presentation. But so I have one question. So you use uh, uh, rib fixation uh, prosthesis for the chest wall tumor resection and reconstruction. So right. you, you should. Right. But so uh, I think that uh, so uh, rib fixation prosthesis is good for the just rib fixation, but uh, it is not good for the uh, rib uh, reconstruction because uh, it is easily uh, dislocated afterwards. So, uh, so, I, so usually uh, so at the time of the tumor resection of the chest wall, I use only patch closure. Mm -hmm. So that, that works. Thank, thank you. Um, well, the, 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 the do you, you mean the cement, the bone cement, right? No, just, just a patch, just a patch, right? So, so if, if it's the, um, it depends on the patient. Most of the time, I, I use the, um, the the bone cement if needed. Uh, if it's small, and the, the non uh, the patient who who who, want, who is not concerned of the cosmetic, is just you would patch. But but but, but um, this particular patient, it's uh, the, she's very a young lady, very concerned of her her her, her body. So I I um, I. Wait. I propose that uh, this is the only way that you can have your balanced body. So, uh, but, but that's a great comment. Thank you. May I? I beg to differ. I think if you have a patient with flail ribs on the ventilator, you should fix, not wait for the patient to come off the ventilator. There is data to show the amount of time spent on the ventilator and getting pulmonary complications actually increases your mortality. The whole idea of fixing a rib is to get the patient off the ventilator, not trying to give time and see whether the patient is going to come off the ventilator. So if you have a bilateral flail chest, I wouldn't think or I wouldn't wait. I would fix it because I know the next day the patient can come off the ventilator. Cost. I don't know. That's a different consideration altogether, where you practice, where you live, and all that. But I think if you have a bilateral flail, or if you have displaced fractures, multiple displaced fractures, even on one side, I think you should fix them. Because if you look at the whole physiology, the chest is a single unit. And 
your whole mechanics is affected, even if there is one side fracture. So I would take that with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Great comment for the experts. <laughs> well, the, um, the, normally I would wait about five days, about five days. But uh, some, you know, trauma patient, they have abdominal injury, brain injury. Uh, the neurosurgeon does, does not want you to put the patient on a journal anesthesia. So it, it depends on the patient. Trauma patient can be very varied. Yes, please. Thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, well, my feeling to attend this session in this afternoon, it is the era of the young surgeon. Truly, because of I have a chance to attend the wet's operation 40, 40 years ago in Hong Kong. And after come back, I forced to do the wet surgery in Lokolated Empire Ima in the, another province outside Bangkok. And I stayed there for a while. And I have a chance to see the uh, efficiency of the robotic surgery at Bangkok Heart Hospital at that time. But right now, we decided to move the machine to another province in our affiliated network. The thing is, I think it's better for us to think about the cost effectively of the instrument or the procedure that we need to do. First, right now, we still like uh, the system that we call uh, pay for service. We need to decide it about the well health healthcare. We need to do be like that to balance among the health expenditure and the cost of the treatment. So with this, I think I appreciate it for all of you to, to share the idea of the, the way to treat the patient effectively. As you said, if we have a chance to bilateral flow shares, I need to learn. We decide that you need to do both sides or one side. Thank you. So, thank you for comments. It, um, um, so, the, for, the, for the bilateral failed chest in the ventilated patient, I would, I would fix both sides. Because um, we don't know which side, at that time the patient is on the ventilator, we, we don't really know which side causing the patients and, and unable to come off the ventilator. And most of the time, because you can see the patient with the um, unilateral flail chest cannot come off the ventilator too. And with the bilateral, we, if we wait days and patient's stable already, I would fix them both. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so if there's no further question, um, this is my last, uh, this is our um, last topics. And um, tomorrow, since the, uh, the absence of the speaker, so we like, I, 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 we like to close the morning session. So no more 7 a.m. waking up. <laughs> so 8.30. 8.30, we'll, we'll start our session in the plenary hall, okay? Second floor, not here, not here. But, but though um, Dr. June will have a talk around 7.30 in the other room on the, um, the, the tr about the, the training of the surgeon, it's combined cardiac and thoracic. So if anyone interested in, in that topic, um, there's another talk, oh, but one talk, Dr. June. Mm -hmm. Good talk, but I'm good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you wanted to know about tumors? Yes. See? If you have a chest wall tumor like this, so you can take it out. And then if I do use plates, anterior, anterior. Posterior, I wouldn't mind for anterior, I will use. Because anterior mechanism is more difficult for the patient. Is a laboring, it's going to go back. Once you reset the tumor, you just go back to the My talk is on uh, Monday morning.